Luke 24, 27. Our opening verse for our series. And beginning at Moses, that is the first five books of our Old Testament, and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, that is Old Testament scriptures, because there are no New Testament scriptures yet, the things concerning himself. The Lord Jesus, after his resurrection, were told that he is proclaiming himself in the Old Testament to these two Emmaus Road disciples. And so that's what we're doing. We're looking at Jesus, particularly in Genesis. And we're trying to find him in Genesis. We found him this morning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And we found him as the creator. Now we're going to look at Genesis chapter number 3. And we'll find him in verse number 15. And it is what's known as the Proto-Evangelium. It is the first good news and first gospel. It's the first promise that's given about the Lord Jesus Christ and His coming. And let's read it and then, how about for context's sake, let's read verse number 7 and following there. It says, And the eyes of them both were open." That is Adam and Eve. And they, they knew that they were naked. They sinned against God, right? Disobeyed God. And they sewed fig leaves together and made them aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to, me, uh, to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And then this word, this promise, this prophecy from the lips of the pre-incarnate Son of God, he tells, foretells, about his coming, his first coming. Are you all right with that? It says, And I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, particularly Satan, the serpent used by Satan, and the woman, and between thy, of course, then again, I would suggest that women are all scared to death of snakes. Jackie says she's not. She's got coons. She can have anything. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his Hill. That verse number 15 is absolutely a first mention of the Lord Jesus Christ in promise and prophecy in the book of Genesis. So, what, 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 what do we have here? What do we have? The Creator, He in the Garden of Eden, He is fellowshipping with Adam and Eve, and He only gives one prohibition. In the second chapter, verse number 16 and 17, don't eat of the tree of the garden 
in the garden, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. And we know that Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command. And so God shows mercy to them. He would have been absolutely just if he had judged them immediately. Instead, he talks to them. He comes to them and he talks to them. So the first question you have in your Bible is in verse number 8 and 9. And the Lord is trying to draw a confession out of Adam. And the first question that is asked is found there in verse 8 and 9. And the Lord said, uh, he, he, he called Adam and said to him, where art thou? Now that's a good first question. That's a, that's a good question that, to, to ask humanity all throughout history. Where are you at? Where are you at? And so the Lord asked the first question. Then he asked two more questions in verse 10 and 11. He says, Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? He said, Have you ha, have you?" Uh, eaten of that which I've forbidden. And we know that he's not asking for information. He's the all-knowing God. He's asking to try to draw a confession out of Adam. He's trying to get him to confess his sin. And trying to pull it out of him so that he might get right in all of it. And initially, Adam, with guilty conscience, he's been hiding He's not only hid himself, he tried to cover himself. He knows things are wrong. The Lord God comes walking through the garden and talking and they're fearful and flee. And they hide themselves. And what's he do? He plays self-defense. That's how we are. Let me play self-defense. Let me protect myself. Let me justify myself. Let me excuse myself. It's not really my fault. It's the woman thou gave me. And technically, he is blaming the woman for the problem. But not only that, he's also blaming, indirectly, blaming God who gave him the woman. Why did you give me the woman in the first place? Blaming God for giving him a woman. Blaming the woman for giving him the fruit. And then he does... Uh, make a statement he said I did eat so he's making a confession of sorts but it's like he's trying to put the responsibility somewhere else at the same time you don't ever do like that do you you wouldn't do like that we are slow to accept responsibility for our wrongdoings we really are so the Lord questions Eve now in verse number 13. And she transfers the blame to the serpent. And she can then by the close confesses, I did eat. And she is in some manner confessing that she ate. The devil made the suggestion. He lied to Eve. But you do know that he could not force her to sin she had to make her own choice about whether she would believe what God said or whether she would believe what the devil said and so we know the choice she made verse 14 through 19 God then pronounces uh, a curse on all that were involved in the sin event he he Curse on the serpent, verse 14, 15. Curse on the woman, verse number 16. Verse, curse on Adam, verse 17 through 19. Curse on the earth, verse 17 and 18. Thorns and thistles. It says they were eating dust. You will be eating dust and enmity and bruising and sorrow and cursed ground and thorns and thistles and sweat. Uh, much different than before. This Now it's going to be hard. Things are going to be difficult, more difficult than they were previously. And return to dust, he said to Adam, he said, you're going to return to dust, which means that the body is going to die. And there's all of this curse pronounced. Pronounced. 
Now focus in on verse number 15. Now that we have the setting. We have the Lord. And as I've mentioned, the creator God is Jesus. Pre-incarnate. The Lord Jesus. He's speaking to Adam and Eve. And he gives promise. And he gives information about himself. It's astounding to me. The son of God's talking to Adam and Eve. And he's telling about himself. In verse 15. It's a prophecy. Predicting truth about himself. 4,000 years before he comes to earth. It's the first prediction and promise. Of coming savior and redeemer. For fallen humanity. So. Then, here we have this promise and the expectation of a Redeemer and Savior runs throughout the Old Testament. Be beginning here, this, this, this first, first gospel. But it runs all the way through. A redeemer, we're told in verse 15, would be the descendant of Adam and Eve. The seed of the woman. This redeemer will be the descendant of Adam and Eve. The redeemer will be male. It speaks of his heel. Will be male. It's probable that Eve thought Cain was the one. Because her first son is, is, she says, I've got a man from the Lord. Oh, she was so wrong. <laughs> Wasn't Cain, was it? God's covenant with Abraham emphasizes a seed and descendants. We're told... In the 17th chapter, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Chapter 22, verse 18, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In the 12th chapter and the 3rd verse, we read it. God says, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so there's the promise of a seed. And no doubt about it, God is doing something through the history of Israel. All throughout the history of Israel. What's he doing? He's, there's a mother going to bring a seed. We read it in Daniel. The desire of women, Jewish women. Oh, that I'll be the one to birth this seed. This descendant. Who's going to be Redeemer and Savior for fallen humanity? You say, uh, well, the promise is about a woman and her seed. You know who it refers to? It refers to Eve, the woman. It's going to be one of her descendants. It refers to Israel. Because... That seed we know comes through Abraham's line. Doesn't it? Revelation 12 talks about that woman, Israel, bringing forth a man-child. It also refers to Mary. And particularly her first male descendant. There is a veiled reference to the virgin birth here in this 15th verse. You say, how so? It speaks of her seed. The man's, Adam's seed is not referenced at all. Man's seed is not even referenced. It's not talked about. It's talking about a woman's seed. That certain, certainly can be reference to the virgin birth. You say, well, you're pulling stuff, in, putting stuff in there that's not there. Well, how come we read passages like this in our Old Testament, Isaiah 7, 14, 
Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. <laughs> that means the Redeemer's coming and he's God with us and he's coming through a virgin. And don't you suppose that the Son of God, whenever He's given this promise in verse 15, and He says, her seed, don't you suppose He knows that He's going to be born of a virgin? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's so many wonderful verses. Let me give you a couple more in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse number 4, and chapter 3, verse number 16. Listen to these great verses in our New Testament about this seed of the woman, descendant of the woman, Savior that's to come. Verse 4 and verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, born or made of a woman, made under the law, we're told. Chapter 3, 16. Listen to this great verse. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to the seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. See it? Verse number 15 is a reference about the seed that was promised and anticipated all throughout the Old Testament, all through Old Testament history, all through Israel history. And then now, what happens? He comes. Here's the seed. Her seed. The woman. Seed of the woman. So the expectation of a Redeemer is first promised Genesis 3.15 here and runs throughout the Old Testament. The expectation. Second truth I would point you to is this. The explanation for the disorder in the world is also given in this verse. Satan who is in the serpent here is at work Eve's sin was something more than just internal, internal pressure and pulsing. Her pressure to sin and distrust God, disbelieve God, came from the outside. By satanic power and influence. Didn't it? At this point, she's not a sinner. Instead, what you have is the serpent being used, talking, a talking serpent. You say, well, I just don't believe that. Well, then don't believe the Bible. Because the Bible's clear about it. And it's not just talking about a serpent, it's talking about the devil in the serpent. And he's talking to her. And does all he can do to get her to doubt what God said. To twist it, to change it. And ever since then, what happens? This one who's the father of lies, who's constantly feeding us lies, constantly trying to get us to believe, disbelieve God's word. It says, verse 15, God says, I will put enmity, hostility, hatred, antagonism between thee, Satan, and the woman, between Satan and Eve, between Satan and Israel, between Satan and Mary. 
And between thy seed, Satan's bunch, the ungodly, and her seed, particularly God's saved, the godly. I know it's a reference to the Lord Jesus, certainly. But it's not only a reference to the Lord Jesus. It says there's contention. There's a battle that goes on between the godly and the ungodly. There's a battle that goes on between demonic powers and the children of God. Do you know anything about it? Better believe it. He's always trying to stir something. And so... The disorder in this world's explained in this verse. Why, why is there such contention and battling and, and I'll tell you, there's spiritual warfare taking place. There are demonic powers operating. It's real. This verse teaches me that Eve gets right with God. How do we know? Because she's going to be at enmity with Satan, we're told already. And at enmity, an enemy of Satan. <laughs> that means she gets right. Because if you, otherwise, you, you, you just cooperate with him. You're, you're not an enemy. You're not a fighter against Satan and evil. You're not a hater of and despiser of evil. Instead, you're a lover of evil. So this tells me that Eve gets right with God. She's, she's sort of buddied up to him, or I guess he buddied up to her early in the chapter. And they had wonderful conversations. And they were enjoying each other's company. But all of that was short-lived. And now she knows full well that he is bad. And is to be utterly rejected. Eve gets right. A lot of people have wondered, well, did Eve get right? Did, did Adam get right? The Bible? I, I've got a preacher friend who's just adamant that Adam went to hell. He, he's just certain. He's convinced of it. Well, before the message over, I'm going to get there. Before the message over, you're going to find out that Adam went to heaven. Okay? All right, don't say amen yet. I'll get there. <coughs> Satan, get this. Satan now realizes that the Messiah, Savior, Redeemer is coming through the woman. And so what are we going to have? We're going to have a battle. There's a conflict of the ages. There's going to be a battle. The first thing that happens, Eve has two sons, and what happens? I promise you that John 8, 44 says that the devil is a murderer from the beginning and a liar and father of all lies. Let me promise you that he jumps in Cain's heart, and he's doing all he can to get him to kill Abel. Because there's one of them that's coming. Who's he doesn't know precisely, but one of them's a redeemer. So he realizes that Satan is coming. Excuse me, that the Savior is coming. And so Satan battles the, birth, the seed of the woman. He battles against Eve. He battles against Israel. When it comes to find out Cain and Abel aren't the ones, but on down the road, somebody's coming out of uh, Abraham's seed. Somebody's coming out of Israel. Somebody's coming out of there. And so he maliciously attacks Israel. Revelation chapter 12. It, that, that's the history of it. For the life of me, you tell me why there's a little pocket of people in the, a little part of the world over there who has constantly been absolutely attacked. Hated, I mean despised by humanity. Not only Hitler, but all through the ages. Why? Because the devil knows there's one that's coming out of that bunch. He started way back there with Mary. Didn't he? 
when Herod was going to kill everybody two years of age and under. Oh no, the promised Messiah is here. And the jump, devil jumped on Herod and said, let's get this thing exterminated. And there's been the battle. The conflict of the ages. It's satanic. And demonic. And of course, we understand that we're in it. Involved in it as well. Thirdly, I see not only the explanation for the disorder in the world, but the expiation is described in this verse. What am I talking about? The atonement is described. How is it that things are going to get fixed? How is it that the curse will be lifted? How is it that Satan will be put down? How is it that humanity will be regenerated and changed and fixed and restored? How is it that a person can be forgiven and be made right with God? Verse 15. The woman's seed it referencing Jesus shall bruise thy head the woman's seed shall bruise Jesus shall bruise Satan's head now that's a mortal wound isn't it and thou Satan shall bruise his Jesus's heel. <coughs> There's a heel wound and then a head wound. The heel wound is a reference, a prediction, and the Son of God full well knows what it is as he tells them. He says, he's thinking, the reference is about a spike that will go through his heel at Calvary's cross. And references the death of the Son of God that shall come one day. The head wound. What about the head wound? It says that he shall bruise thy head. The, this woman's seed, Jesus, shall bruise Satan's head. What's that all about? He's going to mortally wound him, fatally, forever. Damage him to such degree that he'll never recover from it. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that He might destroy the works of the devil. Why did Jesus come? To destroy the works of the devil. Right? Where did the fatal blow take place? At the cross. When Jesus said, it's finished. You, you know, in that little statement, it is finished. Three li word little statement. That three word, you could preach on all that because there's so much wrapped up in that. Yeah. What's finished? Well, payment for my sins is finished. It's been paid for. Full. Paid in full. More than that took place though. Yeah. Satan is royally defeated. At Calvary's cross. Hebrews talks about him having the power of death. And being able to put fear on people. The fear of death. And all those kind of things. And the Son of God conquered it. But the fatal blows come in one of these days. In Revelation chapter 20 verse number 10. When he's going to cast him in the lake of fire forever.
So the atonement, the expiation, is found in this verse. There's the answer. How do you get fixed? Jesus, what he did at Calvary. That's how you get fixed. That's how you get forgiveness. That's how you get in the family of God. That's how you get fresh power in your life every day. To overcome Satan and evil. Two acts immediately follow the Lord's curse and the Lord's promise in this passage. There's an act by Adam and it is a confession of faith in verse 20. And then there's an act by the Lord and it is a covering for sin. Verse 21. Adam's confession of faith Look at it first in verse number 20. This is the first time that Eve is named Eve. Adam named her. Look at it. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Before this point, she's called female, chapter 1, verse 27, help me, chapter 2, 18, wife, 2, 24 and 25, 3, 8, 3, 17, woman, a pile of times, probably 10 times, but never is she called Eve. But after the fall, and after God gave promise to Adam and Eve, of a coming seed that would be Redeemer and Savior. Now, Adam names his wife Eve, the mother of all living. That's a confession of faith. What has happened? The day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God said, death's coming, Eve, Adam, if you, if you disobey me. And what happens? Then he comes with this promise. And gives the promise. That the seed of the woman is going to be the Savior. Brethren, there's only one woman on the planet. <laughs> and her name's, help me, woman, whatever. But this confession from Adam is, she's the one who's bringing life. She's going to be alive to birth somebody. Just like God's given me promise about it. She's not the mother of the dead. She's the mother of the living. And it's a confession from Adam that he believes the promise. Which means, preacher friend, he's in heaven. Because how do you get saved? By faith <laughs> in the Savior. Whether it was back in the garden looking forward to His coming or whether it's us looking back to Calvary and His coming. <coughs> so it's a confession. I would also mention that that's a clear refutation of evolution theory. I know that has nothing to do with the flow of our message, but you got to run a rabbit every once in a while when you see it. If she's the mother of all, all, if she's the mother of all living human beings, that means we did not come from primordial slime. It means you didn't come from a big bang. 
where media or something made, doesn't didn't you didn't come from a monkey. You came from a mother, a human mother. All of us did. And we've never been anything but humans. So, we have Adam's act, act of faith, or confession of faith. And then following, we have the Lord's act of mercy. And he does something in verse 21. Look at it. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And I suspect to be able to clothe two human beings suitably would require at probably at least two animals. At least one apiece. And I cannot tell it, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised if it wasn't a lamb. And I do know that Cain and Abel knew the difference between what sacrifices they were to bring and they learned it from Adam and Eve because the Lord taught them what was going to be required for them to be covered in his sight and to be acceptable in his sight. But this is right from the shot the proto-evangelium. It is us hearing this great truth. There will be a substitute, an innocent substitute, who doesn't deserve to die. The little lamb didn't do anything. It was Adam and Eve. And in light of that fact, what do we have? It will require an innocent substitute dying. And from now on, the message is going to be, we're having animal sacrifices, but none of them really do the job. But there's coming one out there who's going to do the job. But it will be New Testament truth, Hebrews 9, 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And the good news is that God's Son... <coughs> Who's given the promise? Who's doing the full, the first killing of innocent animal and skinning it to make proper clothing for Adam and Eve? He knows that he's coming and he's going to be the Lamb of God. Four thousand years down the road. Just a couple of verses here. You're familiar with them. Isaiah and 61 verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation, and he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. We get the garments of salvation, the robe of righteousness. What is it? The Bible says that it's imputed righteousness. God clothes me. In, my, in God's sight, I am properly presentable because of what Jesus did. I mean, he kicked the devil in the head, didn't he? It was, a fatal, it was a fatal blow when they were out, out there in the wilderness and that first temptation. And the devil couldn't get an edge on him at all. And when it was all said and done, there's no doubt about it, the devil went away with a bruise on his brain. <laughs> right? And there was Calvary. And then what about the resurrection? You don't think he, he wasn't... I mean, it was a blow. And because of all that Jesus did, 
the living Son of God can now make me presentable before a holy God and a just God. It's the great mercy of God. God could have right off the shot. He could have just, boom. Eve, Adam, I'm done with you. I'm going to start over and do something else. He could have. We know that wasn't his plan. But he'd been just in it. Because he's got a precise justice. But he extended mercy. And that's how everybody gets saved. By mercy. Just like Adam and Eve got saved. By mercy. God extending his mercy. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy. He saved us. Titus 3.5. So verse 15, that great first prediction of the Son of God's coming. He's coming one of these days. We look back and He came. And we've got a Savior. Just like had been promised in Genesis chapter number 315. Let's stand. Linda Paul, come play please. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 said, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We find in Jesus in the Old Testament, in Genesis in particular, He's here. And we know it's so because we've got New Testament revelation to just point us back to it. First gospel. First good news for sinners. There's hope in Christ. It's help from Christ. Tom Paul dismisses, please.